All right. Um, okay. So let's talk about debt. I don't mean financial debt in this case. Sorry, I'm going to rearrange this a tad. Uh, I mean technical debt, which is a, a thing that I will go over, but some of you might be familiar with. Um, so I'm Lucy. Um, I'm a documentation program manager at Red Hat, which basically means that I work with tech writers to like program the work that gets done. Like uh, I'm execution basically uh, and planning. Uh, but what I was before was a tech writer. Um, my background a little bit like Dale is in journalism. So I did a journalism degree, did not get a journalism job and went into tech writing which actually worked out a lot better because I liked it a whole lot. Um, so this is kind of my summary of stuff that I've uh, paid attention to over my almost two years as a tech writer. Um, and a lot of this stuff is about technical debt and how you can get around it. So my slides are really boring, by the way, so enjoy that. Um, it's just an overview of what I'm going to go through. What is technical debt? Define the problem. Talk about ways to mitigate the problem. Discuss. That's not that interesting. Okay, so what is technical debt? Um, for the benefit of those who don't know what technical debt is or who don't know what I'm talking about in this context, um, it's a term used uh, mostly in programming. Um, it refers to the future costs that you incur by doing things in like a quick and dirty kind of way um, compared to taking time and planning them out and doing them right. Um, it's the right way and the wrong way and the technical debt way, which is just the wrong way but faster. Um, so, uh, so what, you, what it gets you is you solve a problem in the short term, but you actually kind of create this lingering debt that you go, oh, I'll have to go back and fix that later. I, re I really will. I will have to go back and fix that later. So you're aware of it from the outset, and you know that it's going to need refactoring. Um, but the problem with uh, being on a schedule is often there's more stuff to do. There's more new features coming up. You've got another new release. When do you find time to actually go back and pay for all of this debt? Um, so we have the same kind of the same kind of problem in documentation, um, and it's the same kind of thing because uh, you have different types of tasks. You can be tasked to update some ex existing documentation. You go in, you add like an extra field that's in the UI, something like that, or you're writing something from scratch. Like there's a whole new feature, and you're writing. Uh, a new procedure, new conceptual information. Um, in both places, you can introduce technical debt, uh, especially if the thing that you're adding to was already debt. If you build on debt, you're going to create more debt on top of that. And then at some point, uh, you're just not going to be able to do that anymore. And you have to go back, and you have to just rewrite the whole thing. Um, the, so I'm, I'm not a programmer, but the example that I would think would be, uh, OK, I'm going to go in and I'm going to hard code like this list of four items because uh, I can't be bothered to do it like the, the more thorough way right now. I'm just going to hard code like one, two, three, four. And then like in a month, oh, we need five. OK, so you put five in. That's not that hard. In another month, actually, can you make that go up to 200? So all of a sudden, it's not quicker to do it that way anymore. And you've got to go back and use an array. Am I saying that right? Array? Yes, good. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. All right. Um, so in documentation, every time you publish something that is not quite right, vague, inaccurate, um, you're incurring debt in the same way. Um, so it's kind of it's similar to like engineering. We see three main tasks: feature requests, that's new stuff; request for enhancements, that's like can you make this existing thing better, and then bug fixes. Uh, and the way you find out if you have a lot of technical debt is that your bug fixes crowd out your feature requests, or you have just as many, or you just have lots. So, how do we fix it? Well, it helps to plan. I, I, I don't know if that sounds condescending. I don't mean it to sound condescending, like you, know, you should just plan if you just planned. 
Like, how about you just don't get rained on because like, that would be easier, right? Um, sometimes two, there are two key things, um, in my opinion. Uh, you've got to establish requirements and you've got to establish the time frame. Um, if you get vague requirements, like I just need you to write a thing about, um, about ponies, okay? What, what are you gonna write about? Are you gonna write about how to groom a pony, how to ride a pony, how to stable a pony? Like, maybe, maybe you spend all that time on it and you hand it over to someone and they're like, no, I, I wanted you to talk about just the glistening mane for like 4,000 words. Why did you not do that? Um, so that involves multiple parties. It's not just the writer. It's, uh, we talk to the developers, we put, talk to support. Sometimes we talk to sales and say like, well, which part of the pony are you really focusing on? Because we'll spend our time on that. Uh, so these, all of these groups need to work together to work out, hey, what do we actually need to write about? Uh, and what the writer should spend their time on? Because we don't have limitless time. Sometimes we're on a, a deadline based on a release. Um, sometimes you're on a contract and they say, yeah, you've got six months to like, do this particular task. Um, if you don't have a deadline, then you can very much say, well, what do you want? And then based on the requirements, you can give a time frame. If they're like, oh, haha, <laughs> six months, I thought it would take you two weeks. Um, so can you do that in two weeks? Uh, it's very much okay to say, no, I can give you this one thing in two weeks. I can give you everything you want in six months. Um, so the second element, of course, is time. Uh, work out how much time you need based on the requirements. Um, and the important thing is, don't commit to anything further unless you're given extra time, extra resources, or they're willing to compromise on one of the things that they've already agreed are going to be in here. You know, you can't keep filling up the bucket that's already full and being like, why is the water going everywhere? I just wanted to put more water in here. I don't understand. Um, so usually, uh, and what I've found, is that by the time you go through all of this, you spend 90% of your time researching, planning, working out what actually needs to be written, um, what you're actually gonna be best to use your time on, and then 10% actually writing it down, um, editing it, sending it back for review, tweaking it, that kind of stuff. Um, and I don't know, for me, I don't know if there's a disconnect, and I don't know what like, you guys feel about this, but there's often this, this feeling of like, I, I, just need to, I just need to write something. Um, I think Dale talked a little bit about this. Sometimes you do actually need to, if you're getting no requirements at all, you do actually need to write something down and go, here's like a plan for a book about ponies and here are the chapters that I think are gonna be in it. But is this right? Is this the, the thing? Um, but if you've spent all your time and you've actually written that book and you send that out and they're like, eh, no, just mains, please. Just, just 5,000 words of glistening mane, um, mane treatment products, if you are. <laughs> I'm trying really hard, <laughs> but it's difficult when Jody is there laughing at me. <laughs> it's a, oh, that, is, that is not, uh, that, that was not planned, the, the pony. The pony thing, I, I took that and I, and I galloped with it. <laughs> and that's my talk, I'll see you guys, no. Um, so, the point is basically, taking extra time before you actually put anything to paper, um, even though it sounds like you're spending more time before you actually do anything, uh, can save you time in the long run because it's done. It's good, it works, it's right. The product changes, you have to go back and change it, maybe. But if it doesn't, then that's it. That document is just, it's complete. So, which brings me nicely into the next way to reduce technical debt, which is the blindingly obvious accuracy. Um, so, as a technical writer, that is both technical accuracy and what I've kind of vaguely termed as writing accuracy, 
because it's a grammatical accuracy, but it's also wording, it's also style, it's also um, all the kind of stuff, uh, all the kind of stuff you need to get right for your docs to look like all the other docs in the suite, that kind of stuff, uh, comes under writing accuracy, stuff that you don't want to go back and fix later. Um, technical details, you can nail down through research and testing. Uh, we do a lot of this. Um, figuring out what the basic concepts are, um, then going and testing them. Uh, I always found that it's really difficult to write about something that I don't understand, and I think like others have covered this as well. Um, if, you, if you don't understand it and you just go, well, eh, I'm just going to use that sentence that the developer gave me, um, maybe people out there in the tech community understand this and I'm just an idiot. Um, which is actually when you're starting out as a tech writer, you do kind of think these things. You think like, oh, it's probably just because I'm not technical. Uh, but it turns out, no, if you don't understand it, probably no one else is going to either. And worse, they might not say anything, uh, which, is, which is pretty bad, because then you never find out. Um, so the idea is to, to keep researching, keep asking questions until you understand every single sentence that you've written uh, because people will come back and they will find the one sentence that you kind of went and then you just, um, the um, thing with over, over there and, and, then, and you're done and they'll go, hang on, wait, when you said you just do the thing with the, with the thing, what did you mean? And you'll be like, I don't know at all. Uh, we get a lot of questions like this from translation as well. A lot of our documentation is translated into other languages. Uh, if it doesn't make sense in English, it's not going to make sense in Japanese. Like, <laughs> that's, that's kind of logical. Or if it barely makes sense in English, it's probably not going to make sense in Japanese. And they will ask you about it. And it's kind of awkward. Uh, so I've, I always find it's better to just know. All right. Which brings me to conventions, which is, uh, it sounds like rules, that's why I use conventions and not standards, it's just things that you decide that you're going to do all the time. Um, a lot of these things have requirements in the same way that documents do, um, which helps you actually decide what the convention's going to be. If your convention is arbitrary, then you don't need a convention for it, like, oh well I think all the T's should be uppercase. And it, like, any one of you goes, why? And I go, oh, I just think it looks nice. This is not a good reason. Um, so anytime you have questions that come up more than a couple of times, uh, which you will, we always do, um, if you're dealing with a new format or a new markup language or something like that, uh, invariably someone will go, oh, well, how do we... Uh, how do we mark up like a, a button now in this new format that we're using? You go, oh, yeah, that's a good question. And you could tell that one person and you could call a meeting and say like, oh, hey guys, um, so we're using this, but we're technical writers. Why, won't, why don't we just write this down and put it in a really easy to understand document and then when someone asks us that question, we just, we just point over there and there's no discussion about, well, there can be discussion about it, but there's no like, oh, well, I think that we should do it this way because of the T's. I just really think the T's should be uppercase. Um, so some of these things are set by your organization. Uh, like, always spell the product name out in full. Like, okay, that's, so some things are marketing. Like, you can't ever refer to it in this way. Don't denigrate the product in the documentation. I think that's kind of obvious. Um, but some things are going to be like more granular, like I said, markup style. Um, how do we write procedures? How do we write headings? Um, how do I structure a procedure if it has sub-steps? That kind of stuff. Um, if you set that kind of stuff up early on, uh, as you get these questions, start adding them to this document. Um, and yeah, just use the same planning principles. Uh, consider your requirements, which is like, how is this being published? Where am I publishing it? Is it online? Is it in a book? I'm not going to try and put links in a book that doesn't, no one can click that, you know, obvious things like that, but also, oh, it turns out that 
when you build this and render it on a website, it just looks crap, like it's really bad. Um, that kind of stuff, decide that early. And then everything that you write from scratch is just right. There's no, oh, well, we'll just do it this way for now and we'll go back and change it later. Technical debt, straight up. Sounded more gangster than I wanted it to. Uh, and yeah, translation, it's always a thing that we come up with, uh, especially at Red Hat. Um, does the convention make sense in another language? Really important. Uh, sometimes you go, yeah, this will work really great. And translation's like, no, not for us. That doesn't exist in our language. Sorry. Um, so my final point that I want to make in general is that even really good writers uh, can introduce technical debt. Um, if the scenario is you have a quantity of work that is to be completed in a time frame that's too short for proper procedures like this to be in place. So uh, it's, it's not always you. It's sometimes that this kind of planning hasn't gone on. You do the best that you can. Um, so that's why planning, setting expectations, do that first. That is all I have. So any questions, discussions, things before Burden walks out of the room? I assume because he's going to do an entrance. Yes, sorry, Brian. <laughs> Oh, you got a microphone. So I had a question. Um, you were talking about planning um, as, as being critically important, and, and it is. But then in terms of the actual workflow while you're working on the documents, um, maybe you could talk a little bit about what type of process you think is better for addressing debt. So my, my thought would be, for example, waterfall method, which we used to use quite commonly in, in many areas of development, is a terrible way of dealing with um, debt, especially if you have bugs coming in on a regular feedback loop from customers um, or things are moving very quickly as they often do um, in, in open source. So something like Agile uh, might, might be a better way of addressing your debt on a regular basis, but sometimes you can end up getting overwhelmed by the incoming flood yeah. um, and you never actually get to the features. So I think that you've probably dealt with both styles of development. I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and what your experience is regarded to technical debt. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the, and that's the hardest part. Um, so this talk is kind of about how you can avoid it like from the beginning. Like in an ideal world, if someone goes, hey, I want you to write this doc, um, that you can write from the beginning uh, not introduce technical debt. But yeah, totally. We come into these products and positions and like doc suites where we're um, there have been like 10 writers before us just, just doing things. Um, we're still getting bugs for like older versions of stuff. Um, I actually, I don't really know what the balance is. I don't think you can ignore uh, debt and I don't think you can ignore features uh, depending on your deadlines. So um, there's a lots of stuff that is dependent on the uh, development cycle, right? So features, um, will often become available like X number of months before the GA. Um, before that, if you were going to spend time trying to document those features without really knowing, like getting a vague idea of what they are but not being able to test them, like I don't think that kind of use of time is ideal. So there are times, there are tasks that are tied to the schedule, um, things like features and stuff like that. And you might find, I don't know if this is the case for every product, and as you say, in the really short release cycle, it doesn't really happen. But you know, often after a release, you're planning for a next release, but you're not actually gonna get any information about new things for a while. So I think that's where you can do uh, like clean up kind of work and restructuring kind of work uh, before you get, because that's not dependent on where you are in the development cycle. It doesn't depend on anything in particular. So I think, I think that's probably you know, the start of an answer to that question. But yeah, I, it's, it's something we're always thinking about as well. Yeah? I'll just kick you. Can you think of something that doesn't exist in another language that 
I mean, have you ever been in a situation where a uh, translation says uh, this sentence is gibberish in my language? Yeah, so uh, it's more of a formatting thing, but uh, I, yeah, I don't need um, Very often you'll see this in documentation. Uh, it'll say, ponies are for dot, dot, uh, colon, sorry, I'm like in primary school, dot point one, riding, dot point two, grooming, dot point three, uh, I don't know, stabling. Well, I don't know what to do with the pony. I, this is a bad analogy. I don't know anything about ponies. Uh, and then a continued sentence at the bottom says, and they're really just kind of neat and stuff, full stop. That kind of thing where you, uh, like ponies are dot point, dot point, dot point, rest of the sentence, that doesn't translate, um, we've been told. I don't actually speak a second language, but I can see how that would work. Um, it's like verb placement, the way things are split out like that. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's a pretty good example, and that comes up, has come up all the time in the past. Yeah, I actually really, that's one of my things that I enjoy is working with translation. I think it makes me a better writer. I think it makes everyone better writers because um, you just have to be more considerate about stuff. Uh, I have another example, if I'm allowed to talk for like five more seconds. Um, uh, in one case, someone had written, uh, this operation will take up virtually no processing power. Well, I work in virtualization. Um, that is confusing <laughs> because uh, translation will come back and say, when you say virtually, do you mean like the, like virtually as in like a, like a virtual machine, you got something to do with like a virtual process as opposed to a physical one, what do you, and you have to sit there and go, oh no, it's meant like almost. So if you're ever in that situation, use almost, please use almost. <laughs> yeah. Dale. Um, I'm just wondering how, if you've had any experience uh, convincing, say, management or something like that, that it is worthwhile setting aside this time to work on the technical debt. Um, if you've had any trouble convincing them, or if you've, if they respect that, or I don't know, what do you think? Yeah, um, I don't know so much like personally if I've had this issue with like our management directly, but certainly you get. Uh, interesting perspectives from like product management who say things like, oh, well, um, we just need to work on features. Um, it's also good, though, to establish something that says, because, okay, you know, like products will end of life, right? Um, I think docs should do the same kind of thing if you're uh, like two versions ahead of this version, unless it's a really critical like customer fix that has been like specifically asked. And every time the customer runs this, it wipes their file system and like a dog comes into their house and like eats their pillow, um, <laughs> um, then like it's not worth the, the effort, the time it takes to go and fix it in like version over here when you're up to version over here. And it's been fixed for like every version after that. Um, and support likes to say things like, well, just upgrade. But I think, yeah, at some point, that's the kind of stuff you need to negotiate. Um, and yeah, I think, I think we're trying to, to set time aside for that kind of stuff. And uh, so we're doing a thing at Red Hat, content strategy. Um, the idea behind that is that you talk to all your stakeholders and everyone involved beforehand, you gather all the information that you possibly can about like an upcoming release or a task. Um, then you say, okay, well, I've scoped that and it's gonna require these three things. Is that correct? They say, yes. That is exactly what I want. Pony manuals all the way. Uh, they sign off on that and then they hand that to someone like me who goes, okay, um, I'm gonna break this down into like 50 different tasks and I'm gonna assign that stuff out. Um, so that kind of stuff. Um, but then also, yeah, we're, we're well within our right to say, actually, I think we need to spend some time on, on this other stuff. And, Yes, exactly. Like, really, horses are. Yeah. <laughs> yep. 
Yeah, I don't know if that that answers that satisfactorily, it but. Was a very good so. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah. a great question. <laughs> Yes, I think so. And I think you always should ask, uh, you shouldn't just assume that the person who's asking you for something knows what they're talking about and knows exactly what they want. Because uh, you might have to, like, you know, I want you to write this like 5,000 word manual on this pony's mane. Like, I really, I really want it. It has to be 5,000 words, no fewer. And you're well within your right to say, why? What do you want 5,000 words of pony mane? Is it maintenance you're after? You want me to just describe the main? Um, so, yeah. Sorry, uh, that's a really, really bad uh, analogy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And, uh, like, I, I know you think that's what you want, but let me suggest a 200 word blurb that saves time for both of us. Yeah. Any, any further thoughts, questions, pony related matters? I know, I never wanted a pony. That's <laughs> I've known Lucy for two years and I've never <laughs> heard say the word pony. This is uh, <laughs> the weirdest thing. Yeah, yeah. Unless like it's the dance move, which I will not demonstrate. Um, a pony. It's like a, it's in the 60s. <laughs> oh, like in Land of the Dance. It is a generational thing. Nobody in this room. <laughs> I don't know what I don't know what he said, so yeah, that's it's just a bunch of gibberish. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think it's the accent. I, I am the <laughs> All right, well, I will get off the stage. <laughs>